Okay, so finally we are at the final lecture of the seminar. Uh, welcome back. So this is going to be about history after the completion of the city walls. Now, we examined the last hour uh, that there is different history for the temple itself and the history for the city wall, right? Okay, so uh, let's see. in 516 BC, the temple was rebuilt, but for a long time, for 72 years, um, city, the temple did not have any walls to protect the city, right? And at last, in just 52 days, the city walls were built around the temple in 444 BC. So we think, wow, so this is finally done, right? But again, like the title says, this is a history after the city wall construction, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't Got the cue? Uh, okay. 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 Uh oh. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, just building the city walls around, now there is a visible city wall, but that was not the end because there's history thereafter. We cannot say that the covenant community was fully restored with the visible city wall because restoration cannot take place only on the outside. The inside restoration is also very important. We will see this. Now what kind of history was there after the city wall was built, um, you will see throughout the history that there were many um, attacks to prevent both the temple and city walls from, re from being rebuilt. Now, although the walls of Jerusalem were completed on um, 444 BC, there were threats from a man named Tobia and his people, okay? So this means the outer wall alone is not good enough because there will still be threats, okay? So against this, to protect his people, God initiated a internal spiritual reformation. And today's key figure will be Ezra. Last lecture was about Nehemiah, right? This lecture is gonna be about Ezra. So let's first take a look at what kind of threats there were. Okay, the walls were finished. There should be protection, right? But you will see that even though the wall was finished, there were still a people, the nobles of Judah, who began to communicate with Tobiah, who is outside the wall. Okay, that's in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 17. It says, In those days, many letters went from the nobles of the Judah to Tobiah. Nobles refer to people who are very influential, the prominent figures in the society, right? Now they had this close relationship with Tobiah, and Tobiah's letter also came to them. So we can see there was very extensive communication going on from inside the city to the outside where the enemies are. Also, Tobiah himself and his son married to a powerful family in Jerusalem. Throughout the course of history redemption, we will see that the marriage is one of the most um, significant tactics that Satan's used to thwart the covenant people. Marriage is a very, very important key. Now, we will see the representative two families, two representative families who fell for these tactics. Let's start with Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 18. For many in Judah were bound by oath to Tobiah, because he was a son-in-law of the Shekhanai, the son of Ara, and his son Jehoanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Let's start with Tobiah. Who was Tobiah? He was the Gentile, the Ammonite. Okay. And through these past three lectures, we examined God's fervent desire to build the temple 
and also the city, right? So much that he prophesied this through his prophets hundreds of years before it actually happened. But when that fulfillment was actually taking place, when the Israelites were building up the wall, Tobiah and his men came and laughed and mocked and ridiculed this amazing work that God has so planned. They said, ah, if the fox were to jump on these walls, it, they're gonna crumble. He was Tobiah. And yet, who married into his family? You see, we saw in verse 18, Ara and his son Shechaniah and his daughter married to Tobiah. And so they have, daughter, uh, they have a son, Jehoanan. Who is this Ara? Well, we see the record of Ara in the Bible. He was, I say here, like founding members. In two days' term, it would be like the founding member of a church. A very prominent figure. Because remember, they were like first, second, third return from the Babylonian captivity, right? Well, his name appears in, among, the people who, who, among the people who returned during the first return. Okay, when Cyrus first decreed, let all people who are for God, who desire to build a temple for God, go back to Jerusalem. So these were like the patriots, the fervent believers who wanted to go back and rebuild the house for God, right? So these are really devout family. But you will see that their name is not found among the people who returned a second time. On top of that, you will see throughout the um, book in Nehemiah, at the end of the third return, building the city wall was not the finale. In book of Nehemiah, the finale is these people who helped with the build the city wall and dedicated the whole city to God, and they sealed a covenant. The very covenant that was made with Moses thousands of years ago. And it says, we are going to uh, to return to you, God, and we are going to be people of your covenant. So they seal the covenant, right? But this family of Ara, their name is not found among those people who seal the covenant. So that means what's the point of returning? First return, second return, third return, if they fail to sign the, the covenant with God, right? So they were not part of the uh, restoration of the covenant people. So I kind of like it to liken this uh, group as uh, like the founding member who were on fire in the beginning at church, right? But as the time goes by, this is the first generation, really on fire. Time goes by in the second generation, ah, uh, so-so. And third generation, married off to the enemy of God. So we see this phenomena, as time goes by, people drift away from the covenant of God and they lose the purpose of why they came back from Babylon in the first place. And their children did not receive the faith from the parents and the covenant. So they became secularized and ended up taking on the enemy of God, the side of the enemy of God, right? And I think this really speaks a lot for today's reality too, okay? Now let's take a look at his son, Jehoanan. Who did he marry? Okay. So the second half of the verse says, Barakiah's son, Meshulam, and his daughter married to Jehoanan, right? It says, his son, Jehoanan, had married a daughter of Meshulam, the son of Barakiah. And I described him as a zealous member. Okay, who is working really hard, is found everywhere in church functions, and you know, we, we really depend on him. Well, this man appears um, in, during the construction or repairing of the 42 sections. Okay? You know, the 42 sections of city wall was finished in just 52 days. And you can imagine how intense the labor was. But here, this man, Bar uh, Mishulam here, he was listed in two sections of the wall, okay? In section six and section 40, in Nehemiah chapter three, verse four, and Nehemiah chapter three, verse three. So he was a really faithful man. He worked harder than most of the people. But guess what? Tobiah targeted family just like that. He's really faithful and hardworking at church, right? 
So we can see his name, Meshulam, actually means Meshulam, friend or allies. The name was supposed to be for being a friend or allies with God, right? But instead, because he failed to transmit the covenant faith to his daughter, right? And even though they were successful in building the outside, the invisible temple, they failed in building the internal temple wall, city wall of God, right? So as a result, they ended up giving their precious daughter to the enemy of God, okay? So this actually speaks a lot about the homework for today's church. How are, we, how are we going to fight time? How are we going to transmit faith generation after generation to our children, to their children, and to their children? That's a very important task that we have to target. Because the whole project of building the temple, building the city wall, is about being restored as a covenant people of God. So without transmitting God's covenant to our next generation, this tells us not just to happen in one generation, even Abraham, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The four generations were the major patriarchs in the covenant of the torch, right? That blueprints the kingdom of God, right? So being a covenant people, that means People from here, from Ara, all the way to Shekaniah, all the way to the daughter, we had to persevere throughout three stages of return, right? Until we seal the covenant together as a people of God. We, all generation, have to persevere together, right? Now, so Tobiah being so powerfully allied with the prominent figures within Judah, he has all this information of what is going on inside, even though he's outside of the wall, right? So verse six, chapter six, verse 19, it says that moreover, they were speaking about his good deeds and presence. So these days that the nobles of Judah were speaking about um, Tobiah's good deeds in Nehemiah's presence, which is not quite the truth, right? The lie, they're bluffing about, oh, Nehemiah, Tobiah did this and that. We should, you should be friends with him too because they know if Nehemiah falls, everything else is going to collapse, right? And so he reported also, they reported Nehemiah's words all back to Tobiah. So they are like informers. So Tobiah having all this knowledge or intelligence in today's term, he will send letters to frighten Nehemiah. That's what he wrote in Nehemiah chapter six, verse 19. Okay. And guess what happens? Because of these relations keep taking place, later on, Tobiah does break through the wall without breaking the actual brick. He will infiltrate all the way into the house of God. And this happens through this man named Eliashib, the high priest, okay? Who is this Eliashib? He's a high priest. He's in charge of all the temple, right? Of course, in the rooms too, right? So in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse four to six says, Eliashib, the, high, the priest who was appointed over chambers of the house over God, it was related to Tobiah. This word related is karov in Hebrew. It means very close. Uh, yeah, it's a kinsman, right? So who is Eliashib? According to Nehemiah chapter three, verse one, when Nehemiah returned and said, we gotta build the, the city walls. Eliashib, the high priest, being the example figure for all men, he's the first one to rise and say, yes sir, we're gonna build the city wall together. Somehow over the course of years, he and his faith deteriorated. And to the point, he became kinsman Okay, um, so here we have a evidence that he was actually kinsman. I can't find the evidence that he was a kinsman with Tobiah himself, but he was actually a kinsman with Sembalat, who is the other name who appears with Tobiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 28, 13, 28, so it's like after this verse, um, Nehemiah, uh, Eliashib's grandson is Sembalat's son-in-law. Again, grandson means how many generation? Third generation, right? This is our homework. Are we thinking far down to our, third gen our grandchildren's faith, right? 
very important. I think this is a task that our church today has, and we will break through this, right? God is equipping us with his word. Now, so if now that Tobiah is in one of the um, temple rooms, what's happening? So verse five, it says, Eliashib now prepared a large room for Tobiah. What kind of large room was this? Where formerly they put the grain offerings, frankincense and utensils and tithe of grains, wine and oil prescribed for the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the priests. In other words, this was a room they kept everything so they uh, uh, to distribute to all the people who worked at the temple. Like today's term, like wage, right? Like they're giving out. Tobiah is in that room. So now all what is supposed to go out to the workers of God cannot no longer go to them, but get stuck at Tobiah because he's the one who's in, in, in the room now, right? So what would happen? The workers in the temple of God run away because they cannot sustain the living, okay? That's in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 10 right here. I also discovered that portions of the Levites, what is rightfully theirs, as God prescribed before according to the law, right? And so the portions of Levites had not been given them because that room has been occupied by the enemy of God, right? So that the Levites and the singers who performed the services had gone away each to his own field, okay. So, it was at times like this. So Nehemiah returns from Persia, and he kicks him out, cleans the room, he restores the temple. So you see, the external temple is not everything. What's really important is to rebuild the internal temple. I, I'm sorry, the wall, internal wall. And what is this internal wall? Yeah? What is this internal wall? Well, God has prepared this. The way to bring about the internal reformation, uh, God brought about the movement of returning to the scriptures. Okay. So big point number two, what kind of reformation took place so that the internal walls were um, established again? Ezra read from the book of the law and the people observed, now important feast here, the Feast of Booths, okay? Here now the dates are important. Do you remember uh, the day that the, the, the walls were finished? Now year we saw is 444 BC, right? The Bible tells us the exact date. It was on the sixth month, 25th day. 6th, 25th means they are only five days away from the seventh month, right? Now, for Jewish people, seventh month was the new beginning. It's a new year. The Tishri month begins, okay? So what feast was coming is on first day of the seventh month, there's only a few days away. That is when they finished miraculously the wall in just 52 days, right? So the feast on the, and let me write this here, was a feast of, Trumpets, which marks the new beginning. How exciting is it? They had just finished the wall in like 52 days. So dramatic because there's so many threats. If you read through the book of Nehemiah, uh, people tried to kill Nehemiah. They use all the armed forces and all the uh, bad words. I mean, with all means possible, they tried to stop building the city wall. Okay, so they, but, but nevertheless, they finished the wall. So you can imagine people in this inspiration, in awe, thanksgiving, like, wow, God allowed it to this, right? And so they're standing here, starting their new year with this just inspiration, okay? So that is Nehemiah chapter eight, verse two. I think Nehemiah chapter eight is just amazing chapter. I, I think it presents to us the prototype of how we should receive the word, okay? Ezra chapter eight, verse two. On this day, then Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. 
Because people were so inspired. They, were, they just witnessed the work of God. They said, Ezra, please read us the book of law of the Lord. So it's, actually, it's the people who initiated Ezra to open the book of the law. So they begin the trumpet of the feast, the first day of, of the seventh month, by reading the book of the law. Okay? Now, first of all, this is a great revival, a revival of reading the word. So brothers and sisters, there ain't no revival if you don't read the Bible. Okay? It's just the truth, right? There is a purpose why God wrote this thick, fat book for us to read, okay? This is his book. It all starts from reading. We have to remember that we can't cut either through um, and deviate from that. Not only that, they read the book of the law from dawn to noon. So the young adults, how many hours would be from dawn, it's at six o'clock, we had our six o'clock dawn service this morning, right? Until noon, how many hours is that? Six hours, okay? Let's read Nehemiah chapter eight, verse three. So Ezra read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday, noon, and the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law, okay? So, not only that, the second part is a revival of fearing the word, okay? Now the fear, this is a very um, important expression. How much did they fear the word? How much did we respect the word? I think this is a, a um, heart-piercing question to all of us, especially in the COVID pandemic era, when the online services is very popular, right? How much do we really respect the word? And I think the way what we do when we're alone really testifies how we really are, right? Not when there are a lot of people, right? How I do it when I'm alone it really speaks for who I really am and what I really do, okay? Well, let's look at well, how, what the people did. Nehemiah chapter eight, verse three, again, the same verse, all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Like everybody's very paying attention, okay? The Hebrew expression for this is very amazing. The Hebrew expression for they were attentive, okay? Attentive to the book of law, it means, if you literally translate this, it means the, Years of all the people were in the book of the law. That means our ears are like stuck to the book of the law, okay? That's how attentive the people were when they're listening Ezra reading the book of the law, okay? They listened to the word so intently lest if a single word would drop to the ground that they will miss understanding just one word from Ezra's mouth. Okay, so you know, usually um, our senior pastor, Reverend Noah Park, uh, he always emphasized the basic posture of a Christian is attention. You know, we have our few young adults just from the army, okay, um, on the break too. Basic stance of a Christian is stance of attention, right? Why? So that we can listen to him well? No, it's not just that. Putting our ears on the word of God is a very important beginning of all things in our walk of faith. Because whether we, our, our, our ears are in the book of law or not determines whether I am a person who fears God or not. That's why he always reinforced you have to be in attention mode every time we are before the word. So let me elaborate a little more. People who fear the word or fear God give their fullest attention to it. And let's read Proverbs chapter two, verse one through five. It says, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your hearts to understanding and you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. 
This presents a very, very important formula of faith. When our ears are stuck to the book of the law, can then we what? Discern the fear of the Lord. That means only, from start, only by starting, by putting our ears to the word of God, then can we really know what is discerning and what, what is fearing God and what is not fearing God, okay? We can't get here without this. And only when we fear God can we know God. So it doesn't matter how many Bible studies you attend. Yes, I mean, the number matters, you know. But what I'm trying to say is what really matters is are we really here to listen to him? When we open the Bible read in the morning, are we really there with our ears on the book, on his heart? Only then we can have we can learn how to fear God. Only then we can know God. Now here know, here the knowledge. He says discover the knowledge. Only when we discern the fear of the Lord can then we discover the knowledge of God. This word knowledge of God, knowing God, is not a knowing by academic intellectual pursuit. Knowing God is knowing by experience, okay? So for example, we all, if you're all Singaporean citizens, then you know the president of this country, right? We all know who's the president of the country. No? Yes, <laughs> right? But does he know you? Here, knowing God means we know by experience. We know by personal relationship. God knows me, I know God. We have this intimate fellowship. That's kind of knowing. And this begins by fearing the Lord. And we can fear the Lord only when our ears are attentive to the word. We need to have this reformation. We need to break out from the COVID mode. We all confess, online worship was so wonderful during the COVID pandemic time, right? But we know it's just like 2% deficient. It's not the same when we are all together and fully attentive to the word in the worship's atmosphere, right? We all admit to that, right? It's time to get out of the online mode and just be here, right? It's the best to give our best to our Lord. And hence we see Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, this famous verse, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of the knowledge. Okay, let's remember this formula, okay? Reading, the revival of reading the word. Putting our ears to the book of the Lord. That's being, that means being attentive. And then we will discern what is fearing God and then we will discover the knowledge of the Lord. May this blessing be upon all of us, so that when God sees the, the saints of Church of Zion, or saints of all of our, uh, all the churches represented here, God be so pleased. You are my wonderful people who know how to satisfy my heart by putting your ears on my word. Amen? Okay? Now, what this leads to, revival of reading the word, revival of fearing the word, will lead to revival of understanding the word clearly. Okay. So the Nehemiah chapter 8 continues down. Now Ezra opened the book. Everybody is attentive to the word of God, and they are listening from the dawn until the noon. It's actually what we're doing today. Hallelujah, right? Okay. We had a little break from, from after dawn service until noon, but, you know, we are exactly doing the same thing. And then here we see the list of these people, 13 names all of a sudden. And we know this is a very important scene because God is about to bring about the internal reformation of his people, right? And the fact that God listed these names I mean they are very important. They served a very important function here. And what were their function? Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, all, all these people. They explained the law to the people, okay? And what did they do? What is explaining the law? Well, next verse elaborates in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. It might not be in your handout. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8 says, they read from the book. You see, they, it's no longer Ezra, one person. 
These 13 people, the helpers, also read from the book, from the law of God, and they translated. So, uh, translate to give sense so that they understood the reading that Ezra did. So, the word translate means, when you translate something, like um, we translated the lectures, right, from Korean to English, or English to Chinese, right? That is also translation. And so we uh, suspect that people who are gathered in front of Ezra right now, some of them were actually born in Babylon, or they grew up in Babylon. So they are more comfortable with the language that was used in Babylon, right? So they were not very familiar with the Hebrew language, so these people came and helped translate it right, the, the, the tough Hebrew into the Chaldean language, whatever. But also, this means, you know, whatever something is very complicated, they made it very simple so that people can understand it. So the translation can work in both ways, right? So, and also, uh, they translated, and you will see, while the people remained in their places. So what does it mean? These 13 people spread out, and they'll go to this pocket, that pocket, like spread out among, in between people. They dived into people and translated and explained the Bible, right? So in today's term, this would be like really intensive Bible study, like we're having now, I would say, okay? So when the people read the word and they fear the word, and you will see that they stood up for hours listening to the word. I'm, I'm skipping all the details here for time's sake. But when people are so attentive to the words, so yearning to understand like the, the, the interpreters, there are um, exeg exegesis people, and we have you know, uh, deans and professors and pastors everywhere here. Like all, everybody's teamed up so we can explain the Bible. When people were so actively trying hard to understand the Bible, a great revival came. A, a understanding that they did not know before. Okay. Very first thing, everybody cried. The people who understood the word, they wept. Through the word, they realized their sinfulness, idleness, ignorance, and they wept bitterly. What word did they understand such that they will realize all of this and weep? Nehemiah chapter eight, verse nine, right? Uh, I'm sorry, this is not the verse yet. But if you see, we can go back. They read what? From, if you see chapter eight, verse eight, read from the book, the law of God. The word that they read, the word that they understood was a law of God. Okay. The Ten Commandments. So we Christians today, we talk a lot about, oh, I, know, I understood this deep word, this profound message. Uh, I had this awakening. I have this understanding, revelation, right? But what is real revelation? What is real understanding? What is real awakening? Who needs law? Lawbreakers. The fact that word, the commandments of God came to us tell us that we are sinners. But God doesn't give the law to condemn us, but God gives a law so that if we were deviating from the course, the right relationship with God, then the law will make us understand why we were misaligned from God and pull us right back to the right relationship with God. That is a word of God. That is a law of God, right? I think that is the biggest, most profound understanding of the word, that we realize that how much I have derailed from my right relationship with God and realizing it. It's not about only years and the dates. It's not only about what happened in God's redemptive history. Learning from that, how much I have derailed from the perfect way that God has assigned me and then wanting to go back, return to God. And so people had the blessing of understanding this and they realized who they were in the right relationship with God and still wept bitterly. That is when the heart of God who gave the word and heart of the people who received the word met. 
And I pray that we will always experience this every day, whenever we come to the word. So in Nehemiah chapter eight, verse nine, then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Okay. So God says, don't mourn, don't weep. This is because his heart and people's heart met. We cannot fix our brokenness on our own. But when we realize it, we know we can turn to God and to our God, no sin, no death, no tribulation, no persecution can separate us from him, right? Our God is greater enough, his grace is so amazing, can cover all the multitude of sins, amen, right? That's the power of Jesus Christ. So when we learn that from the word, how much I've derailed, when I say, I wanna go back to you, that is all that is needed. And he said, don't cry. What does it mean? Don't cry mean, don't worry. I can take care of you. That is God we meet. That's yada. Know by experience, having the most relationship, right? That's what people experienced. So when we understand the word, truly understand the word, then God gives us the spiritual joy. I think that is what today's Christians most crave. I'm talking about, frankly, realistically, right? Joy in walking with the Lord. And Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 10, and he said to them, don't mourn, right? He says, go eat of fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared. Just let's have a party, right? And for this day is a holy to our Lord. Don't be sad, don't be grieved, don't be despaired. For the joy of the Lord is your strength, okay? The joy of the Lord. And this is not about like, oh, do, am I able to rejoice in the Lord? No, that's not that. If you look at the Hebrew expression, it's hedvat yaweh. It means joy of the Lord. It means the joy that the Lord gives. He is the origin of all joy, satisfaction, and gratification in our lives. Okay. So when we understand the word, God gives us his joy. And the joy becomes our strength as believers. And this word joy in Hebrew is ma'ot. Guess what this word means? Hiding place, fortress, security, and protection. And brothers and sisters, this is the real wall that we have to put up in our heart. And it all comes from understanding the word of God. And when we do so, God fills us with this amazing joy that we cannot get from anywhere in this world. And when we have this, uh, and and I I realize, you know, the the dramatic first return, second return, third return, rebuilding the temple, uh, the 52 miraculous reconstruction of the city, well, all of that, and everything was boiling down to this, mouths. Everything that's happening in our lives, ups and downs, right? Rebuilding and tearing down and, and, you know, rising and falling. All of this is boiling down to this point. Me meeting Father's heart through the word and obtaining joy from knowing that he will take care of all my weaknesses and frailties. And he's all with me every step of the way. Even when I'm a sinner, right? We have to experience that. And that is where we are going, for sure. So, now there is this, uh, 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 what, what we call this, uh, um, uh, when, when you, the wave effect, right? Once, like a butterfly effect, the small things get spread out, right? So the more we understand the word, what happens is that the more people yearn for the deep insight into the word, okay? So what happened is that on day one, the first day of the seventh month, on the Feast of Trumpet, people, everybody like us right now, the young and the old, everybody standing, listening to the word of God for many hours, and they realize, oh, we were so wrong, right? We want to go back to the Lord. We want to do this. And then so like, let's have a feast. Don't worry. Don't weep. The Lord is our joy, right? Right? And next day, they're like, no, this is not enough. We need to come back for more. 
So the leaders of the people come back to who? Ezra, the scribe and the priest who was excellent, who skilled in the law of the Lord. Okay, and so um, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 13 reads, Then on the second day, right, the heads of the fathers of households of all the people, the priests and the Levites were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the Lord. Here, gaining insight, this word means, it's sakal in Hebrew. It means to like meticulously research and delve into, dissect. Right? And not only that, to carry it into, apply it into our lives. That is insight. Okay? So when people have this kind of heart to the word of God, God granted them a great revelation, deep understanding. God gave people the strength to bear the fruit of keeping the law. Often we try hard to keep the law on our own, right? But here God tells us it is God who strengthens us to obey the law and bear the fruit. That is where the feast of the booth comes. When we understand the word, God enables us to obey and bear fruit. Hallelujah. Okay, this is all starting from understanding the word. So by understanding the word, the people of Israel discovered how to keep the which feast? Yeah. You'd be like, why all of a sudden the feast of booths, right? Okay. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 14. So the, the, the leaders gathered to Ezra's house the second day, right? And then next verse says, they found. This word found is matzah. And it doesn't mean just like you accidentally found something, like after meticulous consideration and research, right? They finally discovered what? Written in the law, how the Lord had commanded through the Moses, the sons of Israel should, how they should live in the booths during the feast of the seventh month. Okay, oh, here, matzah is found. And so, by understanding this law, so these statute regulations, how they're supposed to keep the feast of the booth, they understood it finally. Oh, this is how we're supposed to keep it. So next verse, verse 15. So they proclaimed and circulated the proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, everybody go out to the hills and bring olive branches and, and wild olive branches and mortal branches and palm branches and branches of other leafy trees and come and make booth as it is written. But look at the dates. Everything happened according to his time. Because the feast of the booth is on what day? The seventh month, 15th day, okay? So fifth feast of booth is on the 15th day of the seventh month, okay? Now, in order for the people to keep the feast of the booth on the day that God instituted. Now we know by this, people did not have any idea about the feast of booth. They did not know the proper way of keeping the feast of booth, right? They couldn't know any better. But still, the day that people have forgotten, God didn't. God knows the seventh of the uh, 15th, uh, 15th of seventh is the feast of booth. So in order for people to understand and keep this feast, God allowed the people to finish the wall in just 52 days on the 25th of the sixth month, right? And people are inspired. This happened to be before the Feast of the Trumpet. Imagine it extended into the Feast of Trumpet, a week longer, right? Then they would not be gathered together to listen to the law, whatever, right? So they finished the wall on time, and on the first day of the seventh month, they finished everything, they're filled with inspiration. Wow, we finished it by God's grace. So we want to listen to the word of God, right? And then on top of that, there was great work of the Holy Spirit. People were filled and they're like, repented. So the second day, they wanted to read, they wanted to understand more. They filled with inspiration. God filled the inspiration of the people, so they delved into the word to gain insight. And as a result, because this happened, to, this happened on the second day, until the 15th day, they have about two weeks for the people to go out and really make booth. 
God strengthened us to obey his word. Everything is his work. And he will make this happen to all of us in our lives as well. And so everybody obeyed. And do you know what, how God recorded this? This is from now God's perspective, right? In the image chapter eight, verse 17, God says, the entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity, this is their real purpose, right? Returned from the captivity, made booths and live in them. And feast of booths lasts for seven days. So from 15th until 22nd, right? And this is what he says. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so. From when? From the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. How much time are we talking about here? When is the days of Joshua? When the Israelites entered into Canaan, right? So what year is that? 1406, right? So the, the law of a feast was given so that people would keep it once they enter into Canaan. So if you start from 1406, what is that day? This is 444 BC, right? The city wall was completed. So we're talking about 962 years ago, God gave his word to Moses, and these people in the days of Nehemiah, with help of Ezra, they went across the time, back 962 years ago, fetched the word, and brought that word, and presented the fruit of the word to God. She remembers that. Never once, the people gave the fruit of my word. And I think the fact that we are learning this, we are learning about what these people did with Ezra, it's because God wants the same fruit from us. Back in our church in Pyongyang, we actually, we have the water gate. This all happened, Nehemiah chapter eight, it all happened in the place called the water gate. Okay, a plaza in front of the water gate. And now I realize, you know why? Because there's so many names in the Bible, the place names that you could name these places, right? But I realized, wow, Reverend Emma Park really wanted the people to observe the feast of Booth the right way that God wants us to, just like Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 17. So why is the Feast of Booth so important then, right? Okay. So Feast of Booth, if you see in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 18, people will go into the booth and the mom and dad will bring their children and they live out in a tent for seven days. And what would they do in the tent for seven days? Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 18. Okay. He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last day. Now, this is chapter 8, 18. It's talking about Feast of Booth, okay? So first day to the seventh day, every day they read the book of the law. They read the ancient word to them, right? And so on the eighth day, they had the solemn assembly according to the ordinance. That's what happened. So why is the Feast of Booth so important? This is what God commanded the Israelites to live in the booth for seven days so they can reenact what their forefathers did during the wilderness journey. Okay, so let's go to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 43. Okay. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 43. So that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now this is part of uh, where God commands his people to keep the feast of the booth, okay? The wilderness journey was a, a, a journey that was impossible for human beings. Because wilderness is not a place fit for human beings to even survive. It was filled with the howling beasts, the scorpions, the serpents. They don't, they don't have any ways or roads. You're completely lost, right? There's no food. You cannot farm. 
Yet God fed them with manna. God protected them with a cloud of pillar and cloud of fire. It says that they, even though they journeyed for 40 years, their shoes never wore out. They never had blisters on their feet. Okay? So here, God is saying, that same God has been with you when you return from the Babylon. I have brought you out from the Babylon. I was with you when you rebuilt the temple. I was with you when you're fighting and frustrated against all the 72 years of frustrations of not being able to build the wall. But I was with you every step of the way, and I was with you when you rebuilt the wall in just 52 days. That God who was with your forefathers in the wilderness journey, it is I. I am the Lord your God. And brothers and sisters, Romans chapter 8, verse 2 says, I have set you free from the law of sin and death. So God has also brought us out. And ever since, we have been going into the spiritual journey, right? And many times, it doesn't seem like he's there with us. And we're like, where is he, Lord? You know, well, how come I'm abandoned and stranded here, right? But do you know what God says? He says, in the wilderness journey, in the Babylonian captivity, in the return from the Babylonian captivity, even to this day, I am the same Lord and I am with you. That's what the history of redemption attests to. And from God's perspective, he says this. This is how he's been with us. And Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31, he says, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you. This is not talking about our perspective because we don't see God, right? This is from his perspective. He says, he has been carrying us all the way. Just as a man carries his son in all the way which you have walked until you came to this place, I have been with you. I am your Yahweh. That God is alive. He is with us. Okay? And he wants us to have the spiritual feast of booth where all the families gather together. Teach the children, right? This is what our God did for our forefathers. From then until now, never once he changed. We were bad and evil, but he was always faithful and kept his promises. That is what we need to teach and ingrain into our children's heart, right? The good hand of our God. Ezra knew about this. Nehemiah knew about this that the good hand of our God has been with us every step of the way. He has been with us now, and he will continue to be with us until the reconstruction, the, the, the consummation of the new Jerusalem. Okay. We can learn the good hand of our God, not through just a simple Sunday Christian life, I'm sorry, I have to say it, okay? Sunday Christians are not going to be able to know redemptive history. Do you see how these people were so engaged in studying the word of God, right? Seven days in the booth, you have to spend your time with the children teaching the Bible. Are we able to do that, okay? So in the Feast of the Booth, this is a booth, okay? It is about what we learn is really the history of redemption, right? This is where God teaches the people and the people teach their children. And we know that the people understood the history of redemption because if you go to Nehemiah 9, we have been studying Nehemiah 8. So if you go to Nehemiah 9, Nehemiah 9, you will see their narrating of their understanding of redemptive history. It all starts from the covenant of torch that God made with, God made with Abraham and the wilderness journey and how they came out from, uh, they came into um, the, uh, the Canaan, and all the hornets came and fought them off, and then how they had judges period, right? And the people were corrupt, and they have this evil cycle of sinning and forgiving and sinning, and, right? And then after that, we have the, the very same redemptive history we are learning today. This is what they're learning. Read Nehemiah chapter 9. It's exactly the same, okay? And from there, we have the surging of true thanksgiving. Okay. And I want you to quote on Reverend Evan Park's sermon back in 2010, in November 21st. He talked about the greatest thanksgiving in the booths. And what he said is, 
Once people understand the redemptive history and how God has been faithful throughout generations, despite how sinful we are, and once one understands that God is with you no matter where you go, whether you are in heaven or hell, then from that person will be a burst forth of true thanksgiving. Thank you for your good hand being with me every step of my life. That thanksgiving will be more explosive than the dynamite, he said. That thanksgiving is the greatest healing medicine of all that human beings can attain. This is what God wants to give us, the joy, mawots of the Lord. That's why we went through captivity, <laughs> return to construction, so that we can come back to the word, everybody. And not only for us, we have to learn it, right? We have to sakal, to, to delve into the word and dissect it and understand it, so we can finally have the real insight and share it with our children and with their children and their children. That is the only way we can prevent from, you know, the three generations of the families who married into Tobiah's family? We can prevent that from happening, okay? Here, I have some photos of the actual things, uh, the Feast of Booth that's taking place in Israel today. You know, Jewish people are amazing. They still keep it. Do you see this mom here and the children out in where? Wilderness, teaching that your forefathers have walked through this journey in a tent like this, and God was with them. And the same God is with us, right? And this is Feast of Booth that they, they made here. And also, you see this big tabernacle here, and you see like the adults and children. And I really, really praise God for having same thing here. You know, we have all seniors, and we have also the young generation. I just really thank our Father for allowing us to study the Word together like this. This is really amazing, right? And then you see the tent here. They have all these like photos like this to explain the same redemptive history like we do. We're not the only one who did the redemptive history, right? Right? This is the only way to fight the age and generation and time. And so even in people who live in apartments, they leave behind their fine, luxurious apartments. They come out into their balconies, building these you know, huts, and they live in it for seven days. Or if you don't have a balcony, you in a place like this. In the, you're not as comfortable. You're going to be very uncomfortable. There is no, you know, no luxurious comfort of your home. Just so that they can remember the days of old. And this is a title verse of all the History Redemption series, Remember the Days of Old, okay? So in conclusion, this is the revival, spiritual revival that we must carry out, amen, right? The spiritual revival of reading the Word of God, fearing the Word of God, and clearly understanding the Word. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 19. Shall we read this verse together? Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 19. Ready, begin. He shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes. I believe this is our word. Amen. Amen. God wants us to understand his book so much that you know, he has written this Bible from thousands of years ago. This began from Moses' time with the Book of the Covenant, right? 1446 BC. And that became this Bible that you and I have today. And he wants to understand this word so much that he brought people like Nehemiah or Ezra so people can be awakened to the Word of God and his great reformation, right? In our generation, too, there was God wants us to understand the Bible so much that 500 years ago, there's a big religious reformation says, return to the scriptures, right? With the wave of returning to the scriptures, you know, the Bible came into Korea. We are just learning about John Ross, who's the first translator of the Korean Bible. And the Bible, it came into Korea in 1882, 140 years ago, right? And so, and then now we come to meet this word, expounding the word like this together, right? Our God wants us to understand the Bible so much. 
And we just saw in the video how Reverend Emma Park was Mount Jiri. And you know, I was like, wow, this is really commendable work. And you know, he's in you know, a super, super guy you know, who was able to do that. And that's just, just back in my mind. But finally, this year, a um, few weeks ago, I was able to go to Mount Jiri for the first time. And I'm really, as you can see, I'm not very uh, uh, fit person. <laughs> Uh, so any exercise, any form of exercise, I like, no, you know? So I was like, oh, I don't think I can go up to Mount Jiri. And I was like, kind of scared. I'm like, no, because it's, it's very rugged mountain. It's about um, 1,800 meters high. So it's a very tall mountain. It's all of stones. And I can't even walk uphill really well. So you can see how um, discouraged I was. But then being an evangelist of, of Shalo, all the people are like, oh, evangelist, I have this prayer request. I have this prayer request. I heard you're going to Mount Jiri. Can you pray for it? And then another guy comes with the climbing socks. And I was like, OK, I cannot refuse anymore. And so I was like, OK, I'll go, God. I have all these prayer requests. I have to pray for it. I'm sure you're not going to kill me. you know. Okay, so, so I go up on the mountain. Mountain, so hard, so hard. I was like, oh, okay, I have to remember, I have to pray. And then, like, the peak is okay. Everybody goes to the peak, but his prayer post is off the peak, like to behind at a very unknown site. There is no trail that leads to that cave that you see. I had to risk my life. And and one of our um, special forces guy was there, thankfully. And then he went, he said, every time he comes here to go to the trail and see if he can find it, because it's so foggy, you cannot find a path. And it's actually literally, you know how a mountain is like this, right? The cliff, like one step, you're off. Like this narrow, like, way, you know, like, I'm so really overdoing it. I'm sorry, you probably went up many times. I went there only once, and it was just a lifetime experience for me. And so there's no trail, and then he's like, um, maybe we shouldn't go. And so then we were like, okay. I was like, okay, I'm fine with that. We don't need to go to the altar to the prayer post. We don't need to risk everybody's life, right? But then he's like, well, can we pray about it? And so I was like, okay. So being such a coward I am, I'm confessing before you. And so we prayed, like, God, you know, we came all the way up here. And we really want to go where Reverend Hart was praying. And, you know, and um, just help us there so we can pray. There's no path. There's a cliff. And then there's this, like thin wood. And you have to like cross the wood like this. And you're like literally like against the wall, right? Because if you one slip, you're off the cliff. And then there is a like big rock. There's no path. So you have to like hold onto the rope and swing to the other side. And I was like, so, you, so this is okay, you can't do it, right? It's really, I, I think it's a miracle of God for me, but then for guys, it's okay for the girls like me. So like, I swinged over and I fell, and then I saw the cave, it's a really tiny cave. And the moment I saw it, I could not think of any of the prayer requests that you know, our members are saying, like, you know, my kids, my husband, uh, you know, uh, I, I, we have so, so many prayer requests, right? The moment I fell there, I was like, oh my gosh, this is not a place a human being can survive. Uh, it just was not. And I was just stunned. Why does God care about us so much that he wants us to know this? That he will send this man up there for three and six months, three years and six months, to, so that we can understand the Bible? I, I was just blown away. All the prayer requests just, just disappeared. And I just only can say, thank you. Thank you for this effort that you, God, have put so much. These forefathers written in this Bible, they're alive. They're screaming at us that God is real, and they want to meet us in face to face by traveling across time and space. This is word of spirit, right? And the Bible is with us on our lap. This is the redemptive history, right? So that let us return to the Bible. Let's stop all the online nonsense, you know, the COVID pandemic, whatever. There are a lot of ill circumstances happening right now. Please know Tobiah came into the temple to thwart us, right? That's the kind of resistance that we have to fight against. But let's stand together and make this our best friend today. Because there have been so many sacrifices for us to have this today. Okay? What are we? Who cares? Why would God care about us, right? But we are, here we are. 
So um, let us read also Deuteronomy 31, verse 12 through 13. Here God wants us to do this, okay? Um, 31 verse, chapter 12, uh, chapter 31, chapter 31 verse 12 to 13. Let's read this together. Ready, begin. Assemble the people, the men and the women and children and the alien who is in your town so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and their children who have not known will hear and learn to Fear the Lord your God as long as you live on the land which you're about to cross the Jordan to possess. And I believe we exist for this purpose. Okay? Just as Lauren um, uh, spread the news about the great work that we are doing here, I think this is what we are here for. Please know that God deems you very greatly. You are his special forces. And God chose us. Okay? Let us take pride in that. And let us really build the real wall of Jerusalem, the city of peace, when we have this high wall of true joy from knowing the Lord will overflow in us. And if there's any feeble knees, let us encourage them, right? Even down to Emmanuel all the way in the back, right? We have the infant here studying with us, you know? I mean, how hard it is to watch the baby and this is the word, right? We have, some of us have been there, right? Let us encourage one another so we can build the new Jerusalem together. Amen? Okay? And young people, in the, all of us, let us return to this. Okay? He wants to knock, knock, and abide in you and show the world how wonderful our God is through you. Amen? Okay, let us pray. Our Father God, we see how much... The world is waiting for people who f read the word and learn to fear you and I want yearn for deep understanding of the word of our God to testify how great our God is and how faithful he is in the humanity who are so worthless and so filled with betrayals and distrust. Father, help us to become those people standing in the water gate, listening to Ezra's reading the book of the law. Wherever we go in our family, workplaces, may those places become the spiritual booths where we always meditate upon your redemptive history. Empower us with the Holy Spirit so we can understand the depth of your heart so that we are filled with maot, the joy of our Lord, so that we can experience explosive dynamite thanksgiving this thanksgiving that surged from our deep heart within, like the greatest healing medicine of all. Please grant that to all the members of the Zion Church, to all the people who are gathered here, all the teachers, men and women of God, Father, may we become that race, that generation, to tell the whole world, time to go back to the scriptures, for the, your word is our life. Father, we thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for being faithful with us. Thank you so much for carrying forth your redemptive history to this day from thousands of years ago, just so that we can understand that you are amazing, awesome God. Father, help us to live according to your word, and we believe that you will empower us to do so. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father God.